Um, so first we'll start with Dr. Vargas from LSU Shreveport, uh, who will be speaking to us on does laparoscopic surgery decrease post-operative complications for obese patients undergoing rectal surgery? Thank you. We have uh, no disclosures. In a 2014 study evaluating the prevalence of obesity in the United States, it was found that greater than two-thirds of the U.S. population are overweight or obese. After surgical procedures, obesity has been an independent predictor of atelectasis, thromboembolic events, colorectal and asthmatic leaks, and surgical infections. Obesity in general also increases the complexity of an operation, and this may be especially true in rectal surgery where space to maneuver is restricted by the confines of the bony pelvis. Laparoscopy offers the advantages of less pain, decreased narcotic use, earlier mobilization, and fewer surgical site infections. However, laparoscopy can also be more difficult in the obese patient, and the benefits of laparoscopy in rectal surgery have not been fully studied. The objectives of our study were to use national surgical quality improvement data to evaluate the use of laparoscopic rectal surgery in obese patients, and also to evaluate the association between operative approach and post-operative complications by examining outcomes across laparoscopic and open rectal surgery in both obese and non-obese patients. We used NSQIP data from 2005 to 2011, and we included only patients undergoing elective rectal surgery. Our outcome measures included surgical infections, pulmonary complications, acute renal failure, thromboembolic events, sepsis, blood transfusions, and reoperations. We used multivariable logistic regression analysis to determine the association between operative approach and postoperative complications. We found a statistically significant interaction between obesity and operative approach, and therefore we stratified our logistic regression models by obesity status to determine the effect of laparoscopy in obese and non-obese patients separately. We also evaluated odds ratios based on BMI and operative approach, where we used a patient with a normal BMI undergoing a laparoscopic procedure as the reference. We began with 31,904 patients undergoing elective rectal surgery. We excluded patients in whom a BMI could not be calculated due to missing height and weight variables and those with an ASA class four or five. We also excluded patients who had undergone an operation in the preceding 30 days, those with disseminated cancer, and underweight patients with a BMI of less than 18. Our final cohort consisted of 24,045 patients. 32% of our cohort met the criteria for obesity. In comparing patient factors between the two groups, we found statistically significant differences, although likely not clinically significant differences, in age, gender, and race distribution. Open procedures were more commonly performed. Protective stomas were less common in the obese patients. And in terms of uh, surgical complications, obese patients fared worse having more surgical infections, pulmonary complications, thromboembolic events, and sepsis. Obese patients also had more reoperations within the 30-day postoperative period. Obese patients had more complications regardless of the surgical approach. However, when compared to open surgery, laparoscopy benefited both groups with fewer complications. A similar trend is seen for surgical infections and sepsis. Pulmonary and thromboembolic events were similar in the laparoscopic group, but increased for open procedures in both obese and non-obese patients. Obese patients undergoing open surgery had the highest rate of reoperations. In our logistic regression model, we found that for non-obese patients, there was a 32% decreased odds of developing a postoperative complication with a laparoscopic approach. For obese patients, the benefit of laparoscopy was even greater, with a 41% lower odds of developing a postoperative complication. In this group, super obese patients had a 21% higher likelihood of developing a postoperative complication when compared to obese patients. And looking at the interaction in a slightly different way, if we consider, consider a patient with a normal BMI undergoing a laparoscopic procedure as the reference, we can see a trend towards an increased likelihood for complications as the BMI increases and when the procedure is performed open. 
So in conclusion, laparoscopic rectal surgery is associated with fewer complications than open rectal surgery in both obese and non-obese patients, and a minimally invasive approach may be of greater benefit to the obese patient. And lastly, in carefully selected patients, rectal surgery outcomes may be improved with a minimally invasive approach. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Um, is there a code or a way to differentiate within the NISQIP database as to whether or not a patient undergoes reoperative pelvic surgery? So do we know if these are primary operative pelvises or if they've had surgery in the past? And do you think that would change things? There's no way to tell from the, dat the database if it had prior surgery. Um, so that, that would be difficult to determine with the data available. Um, I don't know if that would make a difference uh, in terms of increasing or decreasing the rate of complications in Do you think another event. May make a difference as to who's chosen for laparoscopic surgery. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. There were questions from the audience. Uh, first of all, remember that you can submit your questions. Uh, you, know, you can mobile and text me uh, through the Sages uh, app. If not, certainly come up to the microphones if you have questions. Um, Gabriel, I guess one quick question: What about conversions? How do you, can you define conversion in this group or not? We can't uh, define it in this group. Um, so some of these patients who are um, categorized as having undergone an open procedure may have started off initially uh, with a laparoscopic approach. So that could explain uh, the higher rate of complications seen in that group. Okay, so that's, that's a good point that, that obviously la successful laparoscopy is good, mm -hmm. right? Question in the back. Jay Salimat from uh, Peoria, Illinois. I do both minimally invasive uh, general and bariatric surgery. Uh, in these elective uh, colorectal patients uh, that are morbidly obese, did you guys implement any preoperative uh, weight loss measures like uh, ultra low calorie liquid diet that we do for uh, bariatric surgery patients to reduce their BMIs? Um, at our institution, we do not. And um, certainly for diverticular disease and things of that sort, that might be something to consider. For cancer operations, that would be difficult to do to delay their surgery to allow for weight loss. That's a good point, Gabrielle. Can you tell us, do we know the diagnosis breakdown amongst these patients? Were they mainly cancer? Were they were all you know, like pouches or, or rectal prolapse? Uh, approximately 32% of the cohort um, had a diagnosis of cancer. Question here. Thank you for your talk. I'm Klaas Habegaard from the Netherlands. Did I read it correctly that one in six patients you excluded uh, had surgery 30 days before for rectal cancer? What did you do to those patients? I'm sorry? What, what would be the operation 30 days before the resection? I don't know. Um, we don't have that information um, in the data. There is only a variable that states that they've had a previous operation in the preceding 30 days. I can't imagine what it would be other than maybe uh, making an ostomy. I, I would say so, I guess. A stoma might be one of the possibilities. Yeah. Or maybe diagnostic yeah. laparoscopy, but uh, uh, you don't know. Potentially. So. I, don't, I don't know. We don't have the, that information in the database. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Gabrielle, this is, so you're a fellow now, right? Yes, sir. You're going to stay on. So this year, you've done open re rectal surgery, right? Yes, And sir. you've done laparoscopic. Yes, sir. Right. So who chooses that? Uh, the surgeon. Right. So <laughs> what, what might that introduce then when looking at this data? I'm sorry, say that again? What, what might that introduce when looking at the data? Um, as far as how to select the appropriate uh, patients? Right. Yeah. yeah, so definitely something to consider um, if you have uh, the skill set to be able to uh, safely do uh, laparoscopic surgery in the pelvis would be to try and, and consider that for obese patients. Right. So is it, so, so I think the study is a good study because it shows if you do laparoscopy it's a benefit, but it's, is the conclusion that laparoscopy for all cases is good, or is it the selected, the appropriate use of laparoscopy is what we're, we're exactly. aiming for? Yeah. Appropriate use of laparoscopy, yes, sir. All right. Would that be our take-home message? Yes, sir. All right. Good. Thank you very much.